a KQED HD production. Aspiring astronauts dream of floating around in space, untethered. But scientists have found that the human body actually needs the pull of the Earth's gravity in order to stay healthy. We have evolved in a one gravity environment. So it's not surprising that few of the systems that we have developed require gravity for normal function. Roger, how does it look? This is a reality that astronauts have been experiencing since the inception of NASA's landmark Apollo space program in the 1960s. Behind the scenes, several astronauts paid a physical price for the Apollo-era exploits. Fifteen of the 29 astronauts either became ill during the flight or upon uh, return, and that was unusual because these are really healthy people. Hayes on Apollo 13 got very, very ill. And he, he had a respiratory infection. Some just had what seemed to be head colds. Fast forward 20 years to 1991. San Francisco-based molecular biologist Millie Hughes Fulford became the first woman to travel into space as a working scientist. It was uh, unbelievably incredible because it was a dream and not everyone gets a dream. She was part of NASA's first mission dedicated exclusively to the medical sciences. Her job was to carry out experiments for scientists from around the world. In one experiment with rats, she investigated why space travelers become sick. The research focused on immune cells called T cells. If you think of an army, and the army being the immune system, the general would be the T cell. It gets the message, oh, we have an invader, and it sends out signals to make antibodies, to start eating up all those extra little bacteria. It's the general, it regulates the entire immune system. The research found that in space, T cells don't send out the signals they're supposed to. As a result, space travelers can become sick now we believe it's gravity that's causing the changes and the T-cell needing gravity in order to uh, function properly. We'd like to show you what we did on this mission. When Hughes Fulford returned from her nine-day mission, she became one of a small group of scientists who regularly send experiments to space. If anything happens at Cape Canaveral, we'll be able to do any step in independently. So, um, great job. Her team at the San Francisco VA Medical Center is preparing to send her ninth experiment into space in 2012. It's what I call fringe science, <laughs> mainly because the funding is not as regular. You have to be patient, you have to plan ahead. There's zero error because you get one shot. With this experiment, Hughes Fulford hopes to understand which genes in our immune system malfunction in space and what causes them to fail. The gene chip we're using right now will give us all the answers we need. We're able to look at every gene that's turned on, every gene that's turned off, and we find out which pathways are not working in spaceflight. Her lab members extract T cells from donated human blood, simulate an infection, then place them in a machine that mimics a zero gravity environment. Spinning the cells from a cell's point of view eliminates the gravity vector that we experience on Earth. They don't really know which way is up, which way is down. The experiment's results could have far-reaching implications, both on Earth and in space. If humans are ever going to explore other planets, scientists will have to figure out how to keep them healthy for years at a time in space. Hopefully, it will aid astronauts that are going to Mars. It will aid those of us back on the ground that are getting older. And so our hope is that we can apply the new knowledge across the board to anyone that has an immune problem. 
The story of how Marin County resident Hughes Fulford became one of the world's 40 female astronauts starts with a little girl in Texas. I grew up in a very small town called Mineral Wells. My father got the first TV in town. I would wake up on Saturday mornings and watch science fiction, Buck Rogers. Lieutenant Deering calling the air control at Hidden City. Wilma Deering was his pilot. She wore pants and she flew the ship. And I thought that was really cool. I love space. I just loved it. And I wanted to be an astronaut. Then growing up, I realized at the age of 16 when I went to college that women were not astronauts. Gee whiz, why didn't I catch on to that before? By the time she received her PhD in biology and chemistry, she had a daughter, and she had figured out that her ticket to space would be a career in the sciences. A decade later, now working in San Francisco, Hughes Fulford finally got her chance to become an astronaut. They were taking people from the university level and that were assistant professors and saying, do you want to go up? And it's a two-year commitment. And so, of course, I jumped right in and applied. This is your first time through, right? In Houston, the seven astronauts who would crew the medical sciences mission prepared not only to perform the experiments, they also trained to be research subjects. Before, we had had missions that had one experiment here, one there, but this was the first one that was totally integrated, looking at people, rats, jellyfish, across the board. These are the jellyfish. <laughs> we were supposed to go up in January 1986, but our rat cages weren't working properly, so they postponed us and put in the Challenger. People were joking about, oh, the school teacher got your place. That's uh, Krista McCullough, our payload specialist, teacher at space. Thank you, Mission Control Houston. At NASA, you always sit and you watch the launches. You just watch. So we were looking for a, an intact shuttle. And when we didn't see it, we realized that the entire shuttle had exploded. Going into space is not a risk-free business, and I think everyone on board any shuttle knows the risk. Payload specialist Millie Hughes Fulford is making her first trip into space today. Five years went by before the medical sciences mission finally launched in 1991. Lift off of Columbia on the first dedicated medical research flight. Every day we would go through an exercise bike, breathing, because they were able to measure the change in our bodies from day to day on, on every experiment. And so it was very powerful to see the loss of energy in our muscles in, in the exercise. We had more data uh, going down than any other mission ahead of us ever. Roger that, Columbia, welcome back. Her time in space piqued a lifelong interest in how the body fares without gravity. She sent up a string of successful experiments on shuttle missions, but her work came to a halt when the Columbia exploded on re-entry in 2003. And Columbia, Houston. NASA's dedicated science shuttle was gone. We decided we would forge ahead I made a few calls to NASA headquarters. I was told that we might be able to get it up on Soyuz. Hughes Fulford found a way to repeat the experiment she had lost on the Columbia. In 2006 and 2007, two of her experiments left Kazakhstan on board Russian Soyuz capsules headed to the International Space Station. Oh, Peggy, uh, Yuri, and Chef, please take care of my experiment, Pete Cummings. And Hughes Fulford continues to adapt to change. Now that NASA has closed down the shuttle program, she's looking for new ways to send her experiments to the International Space Station from the United States. As travel to the space station is handed over to private companies, she's making plans to send her next experiment up with a Los Angeles-based company called SpaceX. It's very possible that we'll be the first experiment to go up with SpaceX. 
and um, we're excited, we're ready to go. I'm hoping to go out on the uh, recovery, the Dragon capsule comes back just like the Apollo capsules came back into the Pacific Ocean. SpaceX then goes out and retrieves it. I'm hoping to be able to go out on the ship to help retrieve the, uh, the capsule and the experiment. So that's my dream right now.